Good morning, and welcome to this audio cast presenting PGS fourth quarter and preliminary full year 2021 results. My name is Bart Stenberg, Vice President, Investor Relations and Corporate Communications in PGS. With us from management today are Rune Ola Pedersen, President and CEO, and Gottfried Langset, CFO. Before we start, I would like to give some practical information. Participants on this audiocast can submit their questions via the audiocast platform. I would also like to draw your attention to the cautionary statement in today's earnings release and uh, presentation, and the risk factors disclosed in our 2020 annual report and in the Q4 2021 earnings release. The agenda for today is summarized on this slide. Uh, Runola will start by giving a re review of 2021, followed by uh, our outlook for 2022. Then Gottfried will give a status update of our financial position before he goes through the Q4 and preliminary full year 2021 results. So with that, uh, I give the word to Rune Olav. Thank you, Bort, and good morning, everyone. As uh, Bort indicated, I will uh, start with a brief uh, summary of the 2021 highlights, and then I will move to our market view. I will go uh, in a little bit into the macro and then move more towards uh, the seismic side of things and, and try to give you a, a holistic view of how we see the market going forward. Thereafter, I will uh, go into the PGS revised strategy, explain how we have positioned the company for uh, what we see coming forward before finishing off with guidance and summary. And uh, as you can see, on this, um, this slide, uh, the full year uh, 2021 uh, takeaways is that uh, we will show that we have improved our competitive position in what we uh, regard as a gradually improving market. We did uh, deliver higher revenues compared to 2020 when adjusted for COVID-19 related government grants. This was driven by a 42% increase in contract revenues, where we spent an overweight of our capacity. We also experienced a significant rate increase from the first half to the second half in 2021. And we benefited from more near field exploration and increasing 4D demand, which I will come back to. On the multi-client side, the market in 2021 was more mixed. We saw an overall reduced industry, uh, industry revenues and investments versus 2020. We, uh, although reducing our multi-client uh, uh, revenues in uh, 2021 versus 2021, we did uh, increase our market share, uh, particularly driven by fairly or relatively strong uh, late sales uh, and uh, adequate refunding on the reduced multi-client investments we had in the year. During 2021, we also established our new energy uh, business unit, and we are already generating meaningful CCS multi-client revenues. And uh, you will have seen that we have uh, been awarded two contract jobs for 2022. The winter season in uh, the, or the fourth quarter of uh, 2021 and also uh, unfortunately the first quarter of 2022, namely this winter season, has become more challenging than uh, we had expected with uh, only four of our six vessels in operations. We are seeing a healthy booked position for the summer season coming, uh, and so Q2, Q322 looks uh, better. In 2021, we did return to positive net cash flow generation in uh, what was a weak market. We also uh, have experienced slower market recovery than we had assumed in our business plan for, uh, for the 2020 debt rescheduling. And we will have to address this in the coming quarters. Gottwell, Gottfred will return to this in his section. I will be brief on the financial summaries. The summary, as you can see, we had similar revenues in, uh, in uh, Q421 versus Q4 uh, 20. Obviously, uh, on uh, uh, we had some government grants in there in uh, 20. What you can see on similar revenues, we had lower EBITDA and lower EBIT, and this is down to the mix. When uh, when we do more contract versus multi-client, 
the EBITDA and EBIT uh, is reduced for uh, more technical reasons. The fleet, uh, fleet summary, if I can start uh, on the bottom right, you see Ramform Sovereign currently doing a large uh, multi-client in Malaysia, which it will continue uh, for some months yet. Moving, um, moving westwards, you see Ramform Atlas currently steaming to Nigeria, where she will be starting up shortly. And in South America, we currently have two vessels, the Ramform Tethys, currently doing work in Suriname, and the Ramform Titan, which is just done in uh, the Dominican Republic and will uh, sh soon be steaming up to the Gulf of Mexico. Moving north, you see Ramform Vanguard, uh, currently sitting in Istanbul. We had to break off uh, early from our work in the Ukrainian part of the Black Sea due to the escalating security situation in Ukraine. And therefore, uh, we expect the, the Vanguard to be uh, starting work again uh, when the North Sea season starts. And finally, Ramform Hyperion has been warm stacked in Flora for the winter season. Now, changing gear a little bit. As I said, I will go into uh, the, how we view the market going forward, and I will start uh, with a few slides on the, on the macro picture. We uh, believe that hydrocarbon uh, will be an important uh, energy uh, source uh, going forward, an important part of the energy mix going forward. We have seen uh, oil demand recover to levels, which is very close to post-COVID-19 uh, levels and we expect oil demand to continue to grow over the next years. Uh, you can see that on the top left graph. On the bottom left graph, also both from EEA, uh, you see different scenarios uh, from EEA going forward. It is important to note that uh, oil, and in particular natural gas, is an important part of the energy mix, regardless of the scenario you pick. And I think uh, more and more people um, are seeing that uh, it looks like oil and gas in the coming years will have an even greater importance on the energy mix than a lot of people believed only a short while back. However, we have a problem. The world has underinvestment in conventional oil and gas uh, uh, reserves over the, uh, the last years and decline rates will create an energy challenge for us. Global EMP spending has declined approximately 55% from 2014 to 2020, reduced approximately 30% from 2019 to 2020, and flattish into 2021. In 2021, the global annual discoveries were heading for its lowest levels in 75 years. This is a statement from USTA towards the end of last year. And we've also included a statement from Total uh, in their uh, Total Energies in their latest uh, uh, outlook. To compensate for annual conventional oil decline, there is a need for three to five million barrels per day of new greenfield conventional capacity to be sanctioned by end of 22 to meet 2025 demand, pointing again to a potential shortfall uh, of uh, energy in 2025. We believe that the energy companies will step up to this challenge and that this is becoming more and more evident to, uh, to everyone that there is a near to medium term uh, problem with, um, with energy. You can see it in the gas prices in Europe currently and also in the, in the current very high oil price. However, that does not mean that the energy transition is not happening. The energy transition is very much upon us, and it is impacting uh, the operations of PGS and the seismic market in at least two ways. First, it impacts our traditional market, namely the search for hydrocarbons. We believe there is a structural drive towards more 4D seismic, more near field exploration, more infrastructure-led exploration, more exploration in proven hydrocarbon basins, away from more uh, frontier uh, exploration. There is this structural uh, demand which points in the, in the direction of the arrow here. However, 
we also, uh, there is also a cyclical element going on. So these, in the next years, all of these may, uh, may uh, come up. But structurally, we believe there is a drive towards near field and 4D. That is one significant effect uh, on the seismic market. The other one is obviously that the energy transition opens up for new business opportunities for companies like PGS. It is not possible to uh, go through and deliver uh, the net zero ambition of the world without significant geophysical expertise. And PGS, we have pointed out uh, carbon capture and storage, and obviously the storage part of it as an important part where we can contribute. Also offshore wind, uh, when you uh, build out large wind parks, you need to know what's going on in the underground uh, and when, uh, where you're going to mount these uh, windmills, and uh, marine offshore marine minerals. So the energy transition does change the focus of our clients in our core market, and it opens up for new business opportunities for PGS. Now, if we take a look, a closer look at the seismic market, where it is now and where it will move in, uh, in the next years. What you see here is uh, the change from uh, 2020 to 21. What you can see is that the overall seismic market, the total revenues were down 6% in 21 versus 2020. This is based on the combined revenues of PGS, CGG, and TGS, which are the three largest seismic companies in the world and which are public. We believe they are a good, uh, reasonably good proxy for what is going on in the, in the, in the seismic market. So uh, we see a flattish, even a slight uh, reduction uh, from uh, 20 to uh, 21, in line with what I have uh, uh, just said uh, on, uh, on, um, on where we have seen the market go. Huh? But energy companies are increasingly focused on near field exploration and 4D, and there you, therefore you can see PGS, we have an uh, increase of 5% of market-based revenues when you remove the government grants. This is driven by as I said, an increase in contract market, which is again driven by an increase in 4D and near field exploration. And also, we have uh, in our multi-client uh, business fallen much less than our competitors because we have a diversified multi-client library in mostly mature basins, which holds up better in this new world. So what do we think will happen as we move into 2022? It is clear, we believe that uh, the energy companies will have to step up to the plate, increase their investments to meet the challenge we have talked about. What you see here is the actual EMP spending growth forecast of uh, uh, and, uh, first 2020 to 21, which is virtually nothing. And you saw what happened to seismic revenues on the previous slide. And then you see an estimate from uh, SEB, Barclays, Arctic, and Morgan Stanley, a percentage change from 21 to 22 of an increase of between 16 and 17 percent. So a fairly large increase in EMP uh, investments are expected in, uh, in uh, 22. We believe the same will happen in the seismic market. We are hearing the same from our clients. <coughs> Most of our clients, or a large majority of our clients, are communicating that they are increasing their seismic budgets into 2022. And if we move even closer to home, uh, how does that look uh, as we look at uh, the contract market right now? This is our bids and leads curve, which most of you have seen before. The dark blue line represents the dollar value of the in-house bids. And the light blue line represents the dark blue line plus the in-house value of our uh, leads. We see that bidding activity is currently higher than what we saw uh, the second half of 2021, pointing to a more healthy later part of this year. We also see that the, uh, the leads and bids curves are now at pre-COVID-19 levels, which is obviously uh, quite important and uh, a good indication of what is going on uh, in the contract market right now. 
This is also driven uh, by a, a fairly large increase in 4D activity, which I will show on the next slide. Because what you see here, we expect 4D activity to increase quite dramatically into 2022. We are now counting more than 30 4D streamer projects planned for 2022. The previous record was 24, uh, which we uh, set in 2012. This is obviously for the entire industry. We uh, know uh, project planning is well advanced with 26 of these surveys, as uh, they are either in as active bids or they are already awarded. And the others are uh, indications we have uh, received from clients on particular fields. So every one of these more than 30 has a concrete project behind it. We're seeing uh, this activity mostly in Europe and Africa, but it is clear that 4D is uh, spreading out to the rest of the world. There are several opportunities uh, and bids out in Asia Pacific. There will be 4D activity for streamer also in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are several 4Ds uh, planned for uh, South America, both on the equatorial margin and the countries there, and uh, further uh, south in Brazil. We could, of course, see an increase even in this number, uh, as we are uh, at this stage only in January, and uh, it is early days for 2022. But 4D uh, is driving the increase in uh, the contract activity very much in line with how we see the market structurally developing. If we then move to the order book, the order book is uh, at what I would call healthy levels, uh, currently sitting at 239 million, or not currently, but as of uh, 31 December 21. 32 million of those is related to multi-client. So as you can see, the contract order book is above $200 million for PGS. <clears throat> vessel booking, Q1 uh, 22, 10 vessel months, which uh, I have a comment on, is weak. Uh, Q2, more healthy with 11 months. And uh, Q3, already at this stage, nine vessel months booked. And there are uh, a lot of activity uh, related to uh, the available months both in Q2 and Q3. So we expect uh, to run six vessels uh, to fully utilized through Q2 and Q3. So as you can understand, demand side, we believe, uh, will pick up uh, healthy in, uh, in uh, 22. So if we turn then to the supply side, we uh, decided this time to uh, include a slide which uh, goes uh, or shows the development on the supply side for the last 15 years with the number of players and the available streamers in, in, uh, for operation. And as you can see, in 2021, the market has never been more consolidated than what it is now. And in this period, we have never had uh, less streamers available for operation. So a condensed uh, and consolidated and condensed supply side, which is also shown uh, in this uh, graph here, which you've seen, so the, the historic low supply of uh, streamers to the market. And we haven't seen this kind of level since the early 90s. So to sum up uh, the market uh, section, we believe that the world needs more energy. It needs more energy from oil and gas in the near to medium term. We believe the energy companies will step up their activities. And therefore, we believe a, a demand will increase going forward and that 2022 should be stronger for the seismic industry than 2021. And this is on the back of a supply side which has never been more consolidated or lower. So with that, I will change gear and uh, uh, say a little bit about how we in PGS are positioning ourselves for this market and the way we see the market going forward. On the financial side, little is changed from uh, previous strategy. We need to continue to focus on cash flow and we need to establish a sustainable capital structure over the next years. On the business side, there are some uh, things you will remember from before and something that has changed we will continue to leverage the integration across the PGS value chain. As you know, we own vessels. We operate both in the multi-client and in the contract uh, business uh, model. 
we, uh, we offer uh, imaging services to the market and we uh, image uh, what we do in multi-client. And we fuel all of this with an R&D uh, department. We will continue that. We believe that has served us well over these uh, last very weak years. We are the leading provider of near field exploration and production for the seismic. We will continue to strengthen our position in this area, and we believe the market is moving in this direction. We will develop new energy into a significant business unit over time, and as I have shown, we are already delivering revenues from it. We will increase speed and penetration from digitalization, which we believe is absolutely vital, both to be able to develop new business models, increasing our revenues, and to reduce um, uh, operational cost and increase efficiency, which is the next goal. We will also reduce environmental footprint from our operations going forward. I will touch upon a few of these goals in the next slides. First, leveraging integration through the PGS value, uh, value chain. We believe that offering both multi-client services and contract services benefits us uh, as a vessel owning company. One example of this is the uh, Egypt campaign, which we finished off uh, in Q2 of 2021 of last year. We were able to secure 15 vessel months with Titan class acquisition from July 2020 to mid-March uh, 2021. So, in the midst of the weakest part of uh, uh, the market we have seen in recent time. We did this because we have multi-client permits in country and we were able to offer to start in a multi-client multi business model shooting blocks that were just ratified and just awarded so that clients could avoid a, a lengthy tendering process and receive data uh, much sooner than what they had otherwise uh, been able to do. We were able to secure multiple programs which were more contract-like programs under the multi-client model and one large survey which we acquired as a contract job. So multiple work using both models and we don't obviously care which model we use as long as it makes financial sense to PGS. And this is uh, one way of how we are uh, leveraging the integration of operating in both uh, both um, these two segments. If we move to our uh, position as a leading provider on air field exploration and production uh, for the seismic, what you see here on the top left graph is uh, um, the total revenues of uh, PGS, TGS, and CGG, our two main multi client competitors. And what we've done is we've just taken the revenues, the multi-client revenues of these three companies, and what you see is last 12 months, and it starts when the pandemic starts, Q2 2020. At that stage, uh, we were the uh, smallest uh, multi-client company in, uh, by, uh, measured by total revenues. And then as you see the development through the pandemic, and you see that the focus on uh, near field exploration, proven hydrocarbon basins uh, takes its toll because the energy transition is, uh, is uh, coming into uh, to our markets and changing the behaviors of our clients. You see that PGS uh, improves its relative position and we have now for quite a while been the largest multi-client uh, company um, in terms of pure revenues. And this is not because we have invested more than the others. In fact, we have invested less. This is because we have a diverse multi-client library which is positioned in mature and in producing basins. Proving our leading position uh, as a near field exploration uh, company. Uh, the bottom uh, left graph shows the increase in contract revenues, which has been driven by, uh, to a large extent, the increase in 4D activity. And we will see this increase uh, continue into uh, 2022, as I talked about. If we then move to uh, new uh, energy, 
we uh, have here shown uh, what has happened in, uh, in uh, CCS in the, in, on the far left. We've made several multi-client sales to uh, CCS only players during 2021 uh, and uh, the, uh, delivered revenues of way beyond $5 million in 2021. In 2022, we have also been awarded two contract acquisition jobs the Northern Endurance Partnership and the Northern Light Partnership, both in uh, the North Sea, or Norwegian and uh, UK sector is probably more correct. So we're already delivering uh, significant revenues from this segment. What we are showing on the right uh, is in the, or in the middle graph is different scenarios of how much CO2 that needs to be stored by the different uh, institutions. And then on the far right, we have tried to, to equate that to how many vessel years would a development as predicted by these institutions lead to. We have here taken uh, the best of our knowledge uh, on for the streamer acquisition and tried to equate it into uh, vessel years. And you can see that uh, if these predictions uh, come through, it is likely to be a fairly large market, uh, seismic market uh, uh, for the activity for us going forward. However, I think it's important now is to say that for us, the energy transition is real business already this year and last year. On the uh, uh, digitalization side, I will be, uh, be fairly brief. But I will say that we have developed a digital factory that continues to come up with improvement uh, projects for, uh, for our fleet, resulting in our fleet going faster than it has ever done, and also resulting in us being able to prolong the life of our streamers and many other uh, business uh, use cases uh, developed by the digital factory. We have taken our multi-client data, uh, data library, the entire library, and moved it on to the Google Cloud, enabling us to, uh, uh, to start selling our multi-client uh, library and, and leveraging our multi-client library in different ways, and also uh, allowing us to develop new, um, new revenue lines as data management as a service, which we have sold to one client and developed last year and sold to one client, and we will continue to push that out to clients. Lastly, on the imaging side, we are moving all our processing capacity onto the cloud, away from the very expensive supercomputers we had to buy in the past. This allows for more cost-efficient uh, operations and also allows for a much more scalable capacity as the, the cloud uh, has um, almost unlimited capacity. Not fully, but almost unlimited capacity. During 2022, the, uh, the goal is to move 80% of our processing capacity onto the cloud. So this is uh, how we have positioned the company to meet where we see the market going over the next years. So in summary, we believe the market is moving towards 4D, more near field exploration structurally. We believe there is a cyclical upturn coming in terms of increasing uh, activity. And uh, over time, we believe uh, the uh, opportunities from, the, from um, the energy transition will create new opportunities from, for PGS. And we position the company now to take advantage of this development. So to 22 guidance, group cash cost, approximately 450 million. Gottfred will come back to uh, uh, more details on the cash cost. Multi-client cash investments, approximately 125 million. Active 3D vessel time allocated to contract, approximately 65%. And CapEx, approximately 60 million, a number that Gottfried will also come back to and comment more upon. So then it only remains for me to summarize uh, my part of this. The overall seismic market is weaker, or was weaker in 2021 than in 2020. The contract market is in clear recovery, and uh, the, uh, the position of the PGS multi-client library in mature basins has benefited us relative to our peers. We have revised and updated our strategy to meet the development we see both cyclically and structurally going forward. 
We currently have a healthy order book, but the winter season has become more challenging than what we expected. The order book uh, primarily points to a, a, a good outlook for the summer season of 2022. And we do expect an improving seismic market in 2022. In line with what I, I would say uh, most analysts expect from the overall EMP investments. And with that, I will give the word to Gottfred Langset, our CFO. Thank you, Rune. I will this time around uh, start with balance sheet, cash flow, and financing. Balance sheet first. Uh, cash and cash equivalents uh, of 170 million. Net interest bearing debt, including lease liabilities, uh, of 1 billion and 51 uh, year end. That's a reduction of 44.9 in the year. The book value of the library uh, year end 415 million based on IFRS and 450 million based on segment reporting. Moving then to cash flow, we are generating uh, uh, cash flow in a still weak uh, market. The graph on this slide shows the breakdown of the full year cash flow. Uh, we had a cash flow before financing uh, activities or, if you wish, after investing activities of 155 million. Uh, and this is more than enough uh, to cover the 81 million of interest and interest payments and 40 million of lease repayments we had in 2021, leaving a uh, net cash flow uh, after debt servicing of 33 million uh, for the full year. Then moving to financing status as of uh, today. Uh, our debt rescheduling uh, in 2020 extended near term maturity and amortization profile by two years. Uh, the resulting maturity profile can be seen at the top left uh, graph on this slide. Uh, as already covered by Rune, the market is recovering, but this recovery is uh, slower than the base plan uh, we used in the debt rescheduling. It is therefore a risk that we uh, will not uh, generate enough cash flow to repay the 2022 maturities while at the same time maintaining an adequate liquidity reserve. In addition, uh, there is a risk that uh, the maximum total leverage, net leverage <laughs> ratio covenant will not be met at NQ1 or the leverage uh, ratio. Uh, this ratio has uh, in increased uh, over the last couple of quarters, primarily due to a change of activity mix with less capitalized motor client investment, which uh, relates to how EBITDA is impacted by pre-funded motor client surveys. So the mix change is uh, negative for uh, measuring the ratio. In addition, as can be seen from the graph, uh, middle graph to the left here, the uh, covenant steps down from 4.25 to 3.25 uh, in Q1. We have started preparations for uh, uh, assessing alternative ways to address uh, the upcoming debt maturities, including uh, engaging advisors. The market and cash flow improvement that we are experiencing should be uh, supportive to this process. We are generating net cash flow, after, net positive cash flow after interest and lease payments. And as shown in the lower graph on the left hand side, our cash flow before financing uh, activities is increasing from 112 million in 2020 to 156 million in 2021. And our net interest bearing debt, including lease obligations, is reducing from uh, a billion 96 uh, start of 21 to a billion 51 end of 21. 
on the key financial numbers. I will be short on this. Segment revenues and other income, 174 million uh, in Q4, uh, compared to 172 uh, the fourth quarter 2020. Uh, uh, there was an impact of, of uh, receiving government grants in the Q4 2020, so adjusting for that, we had a revenue growth of uh, 9%. Uh, Q4 to Q4 uh, based on revenues generated from our operations. On a full year basis, 590 million of revenues and other income compared to 595 in 2020. Similarly here, we had uh, 39 million of full year government grants in 2020. We also had 6 million in the first quarter of 2021, adjusting for both of these, of course. We achieved a 5% uh, growth of revenues generated by our business. EBITDA in Q4, 96 million compared to 129 in Q4 2020. And segment EBIT, 3 million uh, compared to 20 million in Q4 2020. Last comment is on the IFRS numbers. Uh, and uh, you would see that IFRS, or as reported revenues, are materially higher than the segment revenues in, uh, in the uh, 2021, particularly for the full year, not so much for the fourth quarter. And this relates to, uh, to uh, completion and delivery of uh, several significant projects, uh, final data to, to, to clients on uh, several projects. And, and these projects primarily were acquired before 2021, which is in a way, the timing issue with, uh, with the as reporting numbers. I will move on to Q4 operational highlights. Contract revenues to the left here, progressing uh, reasonably well in the second half, albeit obviously impacted by uh, or hurt by uh, the low utilization we managed to achieve in the fourth quarter. Uh, contract revenues were 64.3 million, and we used 76% of our active Vessel time on contract acquisition. Moving to the right on this slide, total multi-client revenues, 104.8 million. Uh, for late sales, we had a significant seasonal uh, increase uh, in the fourth quarter, which uh, gave us for the full year uh, uh, 21 a 32% increase compared to um, uh, 2020. Uh, Pre-funding stable throughout the year. Uh, yeah, we already moved on, so I will move on with my commentary as well. That's okay. Uh, Multi-client revenues by region. Uh, in Q4, the pre-funding revenues were primarily from Asia Pacific, where we have uh, an had an acquisition project for more or less the full quarter. Uh, late sales were primarily from Europe and North America. Uh, utilization of our vessels, we had low vessel utilization in the fourth quarter, 58% active time. Uh, the Q4 low utilization and the current vessel utilization is impacted by project-specific events. Uh, we uh, had uh, have uh, been affected by a delay of a contract award where uh, we had expectation it would be possible to mobilize during the fourth quarter. And the reality is that we are now uh, really mobilizing for that survey for start in February. And we had a uh, acquisition program scheduled for Q4 21, which during the course of uh, getting uh, closer which was postponed to second half 22. And lastly, uh, we had to terminate a project in the Black Sea uh, quite a bit earlier than planned due to the escalating security situation. For the coming quarter, we will have an overweight on contract. We have one uh, multi-client survey ongoing. The rest will be contract. I expect to get four of our vessels uh, operating, uh, and uh, this will increase to six vessels early second quarter, moving them to cost on the next slide. Cost, as uh, you can see, substantially down from pre-COVID levels. Uh, 
a gradual uh, increase activity driven uh, for the first qu three quarters of the year and also there is a gradual impact of higher fuel prices as the oil price has increased quite a bit since the start uh, of, of the year. For the full year also I would want to mention that, uh, that we have had approximately 12 million of extra cost re directly related to COVID prevention measures for our fleet operations. So that is a part of this picture. Uh, for the fourth quarter specifically, we have a sequential decline of gross cash cost. That is down to the reduced activity and, and lower project related costs. Looking then to 2022, we expect our gross cash cost to be approximately 450 million. So that is an increase from uh, 2021, uh, driven by higher expected uh, activity level uh, and also impacted by a estimated $20 million fuel cost increase. And this is related to the higher uh, crude price. When it comes to uh, COVID and costs relating to managing that, we, uh, by, as of today, we expect around the same level as in 2021. Uh, in a way, if, it, if we are lucky, it could taper down earlier, but it, it, this is very difficult to predict. It is clear that uh, cost and cost management remains a key uh, priority for us. Then capital expenditures. Uh, the 22 CapEx plan is approximately $60 million. Close to half of that relates to, to streamer investments, including uh, building a uh, new uh, GeoStreamer. Our depreciation cost will, uh, will continue to go down uh, also for 2022, and we expect approximately $125 million of gross depreciation. Then I actually was at my, the last slide of this section and summing up, uh, we uh, deliver higher revenues uh, compared to 2020 when we adjust for government uh, grants. Uh, we have a significant increase in contract revenues. Mixed development of multi-client, uh, market-driven, uh, strong late sales growth, 32%, better than uh, the rest of the industry. And adequate pre-funding level of 103%, but on materially or significantly lower activity or investment levels. We will have a, a higher uh, cost and capital expenditures in 2022. This is driven by activity. Uh, cost and capex discipline remains a key priority. We have returned to uh, positive net cash flow generation in a market which is still challenging, uh, uh, but in recovery. But as we spend time on explaining, the market recovery is slower than what we based our 2020 debt rescheduling on, and we will have to address this in the coming quarters. I will stop there and give the word back to you, Board, for uh, the Q&A session. Yes, thank you, Gofran. Uh, we have our first question from uh, Kim Andrea Ugedal in SAB. Um, how confident are you that you will take out the September debt maturity with cash flow from operations? Well, as we say, uh, the market has become more challenging than what we, uh, uh, what we thought. And, uh, and obviously we had not uh, anticipated uh, running four vessels in the fourth quarter and in the first quarter. So when we now communicate that there is a risk of not generating sufficient cash flow to repay, uh, repay those maturities, that is exactly uh, what it means there is a risk that we will not be able to do that. That depends on uh, the development in, uh, in, uh, uh, in first quarter and second quarter in particular. And, and as we know, multi-client sales is uh, a key factor here. So we may still manage that uh, or we may have to do something else. 
Then we have a question from uh, Mick uh, Pickup in uh, Barclays. Uh, you talk of demand increasing, but your Q4 booked months or booked positions uh, is down. Um, what concerns do you have that uh, it does not materialize into firm projects when you look at the sales leads versus the bids in the market? I'm not very concerned uh, on that. Uh, as normal at this, uh, this stage, we are uh, in, in several processes which uh, I am, you know, will land uh, either our way or someone else's, uh, in someone else's lap over the next uh, months. This is uh, quite normal, and uh, and um, there are some some big programs that uh, that has to land. And with the current book position of eleven and nine, uh, we feel fairly confident that uh, the summer season will be uh, busy for us and and for um, for our main competitor in the in the, in the vessel market. Then uh, he also asks, um, can you uh, talk to working capital expectations in Q1 and uh, how that factor into your risk of covenant breach, etc., in the quarter? We uh, we expect uh, in a way we've come come down to uh, uh, to a better level with, with respect to TSO uh, time to collect our revenues. So we expect that. Uh, to, to stay on, on that level or improve that, uh, we would likely see, see a, in a way, after a in revenue driven increase of working capital in Q4, uh, more likely to see a, 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 a reduction of working capital in Q1. I don't see that as important with respect to, to leverage ratio, ratio measurement there. It impacts the, the debt measurement, uh, but in a way the, it is the, the you know, last 12 month EBITDA that is the primary factor impacting um, the, the leverage ratio. Then we also have a somewhat related question from Øystein Vågen in uh, Fernley Securities. Uh, is there anything you can guide on expected working capital movements for the full year 2022? And I think it's fair to say that, uh, as I said, we, we are at a, a fairly, so fairly close to fairly natural uh, DSO level now at N21. Uh, it, it goes from what we, we say that we expect uh, higher revenues in 2022, uh, and maybe not primarily uh, from from the very first part of of the year. So. So uh, if we're right, we should uh, have an increase in a way. Working capital for us is not investing money in a project and collecting later. We have our cost base and it's a question of generating revenues and we, we should have more uh, accounts receivables to collect a year end 2022 than we have year end 2021. So I most likely we'll see an, an increase in, in working capital um, uh, in, in the second half of the year. Then we have a question from uh, John Lyson in uh, ABG. Uh, could raising new equity be one option to address the debt maturities? Uh, would you consider selling the multi-client library in order to address the debt maturities? And lastly, if you had to choose, would you rather raise new equity or sell the multi-client library? Uh, we will assess uh, every opportunity, and I don't think it's a, it's a time to uh, start to talk about different uh, different alternatives uh, here. Uh, however, I guess I don't think it's very likely that we'll sell the multi client library if that's the question. <laughs> but uh, but uh, in terms of what we will do to address address um, uh, these um, these maturities, uh, remains for uh, for us to see. I mean, we have done this. Uh, many times, unfortunately, and we have done it uh, in a way which has has been beneficial both to shareholders and to creditors. And and uh, and uh, our goal, and we are confident that we will also find this time a suitable uh, a suitable solution, which uh, should be acceptable for all uh, all stakeholders. We are generating positive cash flow as time goes by. And, uh, and uh, uh, the underlying business is quite healthy. Uh, next question is from uh, John Mastal in uh, DNB Markets. Um, in Q3, you were highly confident that the two idle vessels would get work by year end. Uh, with three vessels idle now, uh, what failed in the market intelligence then? And why should we trust you now? 
Well, what, what failed is what uh, Gottfried uh, explained. We had uh, one project which, uh, which we are starting. We're starting it now instead of in uh, Q4, so that was delayed. Uh, it was not about market intelligence. It was about uh, our negotiations with the client and the, the client didn't turn out to be uh, ready, etc. Then we had another uh, project where we were very close to, uh, to a contract signature when the client pulled the plug and decided to do it in the second half of this year instead. And lastly, uh, we had to cut short uh, the Ramform Vanguard in, uh, in the Ukraine, which should have been operating until, at least until now, uh, maybe even a little bit further. Uh, but because of the escalating security situation in Ukraine, we had to cut that short before Christmas. So these were the three main, uh, main events that uh, took place which changed uh, the situation for us in the fourth quarter and, and, and also impacting us into the first quarter. Then uh, Marstall also has a question on uh, cash flow. Uh, how much of cash flow in 2021 relate to government grants booked in 2020 and collected in 2021? Uh, that I uh, I don't have the answer in that from the top of my head. I don't think it is too uh, material, but it could be uh, the cash flow collected in 21. Uh, there is uh, some, but it is limited. Let that be my answer for now. Uh, next question is from uh, Kevin Roger in uh, Capital Chevro. Uh, can you comment on the pricing evolution on vessels? The expectations for 2022, as you said in press release, that supply will be limited. We, uh, uh, we obviously uh, currently uh, are experiencing much higher pricing in the market than what we did a year ago. That's kind of number one, uh, which we showed on, uh, on a graph in, uh, on our ter third quarter release. We expect prices to continue to, uh, uh, to rise into the summer season. And, and what happens in the fourth quarter is uh, too early to say. Then we have a question from uh, Jürgen Lande in uh, Danske Bank. Uh, on the $25 million of CapEx for new streamers, how many sets or vessels does that cover? It is a um, uh, bit. It is <laughs> not necessarily full sets. It's the start of. Uh, it includes both uh, repair. It includes uh, new streamer sections, which will uh, be uh, replacing worn streamers on several vessels, uh, and the start of uh, producing a new set. So it's a, it's a bit difficult to kind of answer the question in terms of sets. To put it that way. Mm -mm. Uh, then we have a follow-up question from uh, Mick Pickup in uh, Barclays. Uh, Cancelling a project for security reasons is not in your control. Uh, is there any compensation available from the client? Not on that, unfortunately. Uh, then we have another one from John Elias in the AB ABG. Uh, you are basically uh, guiding on flat motor client investments year over year in 2022 despite the positive market outlook. Uh, is this a consequence of more positive view on the contract than the motor client market? Uh, is it difficult to secure pre-funding? I, I guess it's a combination. I mean, it is clear that we are seeing um, more opportunities. Uh, in, uh, in the contract market, which is quite strong, than we are in, uh, in the multi-client uh, market. So it's a, it's a little bit of a consequence of that. And then obviously it's a, an estimation of all the, uh, of the unsold part of the year. We have to make some sort of an estimation based on, the, on the, what we're seeing. And, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the contract market just right now looks stronger than, uh, than the market for securing pre-funding for a multi-client right now. And therefore, we have to make an estimation. Uh, then he also asks, uh, could you give some comments about your expectations for late sales in 2022? No, I, I think uh, uh, other than uh, stating that, you know, we believe the market will go up, that will uh, also impact late sales. Uh, we believe uh, that we will have higher late sales in in 22 than in 21. Other than that, I don't think I will comment further on that. 
Then we have another question from uh, Kim Andre Gudal in uh, SAB. Um, you highlight to establish a sustainable capital structure as a part of your financial strategy. Uh, in your opinion, what is a sust sustainable leverage le uh, level for your business? No, it is uh, that, that is unchanged in a way. We we believe uh, what we need to work towards uh, over time is to get to a net interest-bearing debt level which doesn't exceed five five to six hundred million dollars, based on in a way how our uh, in a way our current size of business and assets. Uh. <coughs> Then we have a question from uh, Baptiste Lebac in the Odo. Um, at this stage, with oil price increase, are you able to preserve your margins? Well, we, we expect the margins to go up. Uh, I assume it relates to the fact that it also impacts our, our cost. Uh, we expect our revenues to increase more than our costs, so the margins will increase with higher oil price. Then we have some questions from a private investor. Um, when you say 4D, how do you know that the customer wants Streamer 4D or Nodes as 4D? That is a that is a um, either uh, in this case 26 of these are either uh, tendered or awarded, and obviously then it's tendered or awarded as a Streamer 4D. So for 26 of them, it's fairly easy. For, uh, for the remaining uh, number of 4Ds, it's based on what they tell us, uh, combined with what they have done before on that field. Uh, so yes, we have a fairly good uh, indication of that. It's seldom that uh, we are uncertain whether the client wants, wants a node or streamer 4D. It could happen on, uh, on a new field, on a new baseline in certain areas, but, but that is quite seldom. Uh, then he has a follow-up question. Uh, what do you think of the competition from the OBN players in the 4D market? And uh, he also asks, uh, why is PGS ignoring the OBN market? Well, uh, the, the 4D, uh, there are some 4Ds shot with, uh, with notes. Uh, and uh, what uh, so far, uh, still <coughs> the large majority is shot with, uh, with streamers. Uh, that's kind of uh, number one. Uh, we don't see we don't see any uh, you know uh, over, uh, let's say formerly shot with uh, streamers now shot with 4D. We don't, I don't think I have any examples of that happening. And when it comes to new fields, it depends. Uh, as I said, uh, some uh, some fields would choose nodes, <clears throat> but still I would say a majority is to choose streamers. Streamers still. Uh, to say that we ignore the node market is, is not correct. We have actually entered into a strategic collaboration with MagSize uh, for uh, addressing the combined node and streamer market because we do believe that over time there should be uh, room to grow the market where you do a combined survey with uh, uh, some nodes and some streamer acquisition and, and uh, put that together and get a uh, an image of the surf surface which is uh, even better than only streamer and cheaper than only node. Very good. Last question from the uh, private investor. Uh, are you planning to sell any of your vessels? No, we're not planning to sell any of our vessels. <coughs> then we don't have any uh, more questions at this time from the audience, so uh, we'll pause for uh, a moment to allow anybody to type in their last questions. Okay, as there seems to be no further questions from the audience, uh, we thank you all for uh, participating and uh, have a nice day.